We're learning about the Beis Hamikdash at the moment, and the significance, and what the role of the Beis Hamikdash is, and the different angles and perspectives that are offered on it. So one of the interesting things to look at in understanding the Beis Hamikdash is the, the history. And, and, and when I say the history, I don't mean to go through the history, but there are three major components, three major segments of the history of the Beis Hamikdash. And those are the first Beis Hamikdash, the second Beis Hamikdash, and the future third Beis Hamikdash. So whenever we talk about Beis Hamikdash, it's in that context. And it's very interesting. Once you, once you analyze it and once you look into it, it's very interesting to appreciate what the differences are between the three. So let's start with the first Beis Hamikdash. The first Beis Hamikdash had certain things about it that are very unique. Firstly, it was built directly on Hashem's instruction. So Hashem told King David that he should purchase a piece of land. And in fact, King David did the groundwork to prepare for the construction of the first Beis Hamikdash. He was not allowed to build it himself because King David had engaged in war. And Hashem uses the expression, he says, there's blood on your hands. And if there's blood on your hands, you cannot be the person who builds a Beis Hamikdash that is supposed to be the exact opposite of that. It's to bring peace to the world. It's supposed to be a, a place of atonement. So it's incongruous for a person who has blood on their hands to build the Beis Hamikdash. So all King David could do was lay the groundwork. Then later, his son, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, he was the one who actually built the first Beis Hamikdash. And it's a very interesting story, by the way. You should, you should really look at it. It's very interesting how they built it and who they engaged. And they, there was a buy-in from neighboring countries who sent artisans to help to build the Beis Hamikdash. The Gemara tells a very interesting story about how he engaged the services of Ashmadai, who's the king of the demons. It's a very interesting story. Eventually, when the Beis Hamikdash was completed, and Shlomo Amelech, as you know, was an incredibly wealthy person, so he really laid it on and made some very beautiful components in the first Beis Hamikdash. So when it was completed and they had to do the initiation or the, the official opening, so Shlomo Amelech prays, very interesting prayer, which is basically to ask Hashem that any time that people come to this place and any time that they approach Hashem and they ask for something, Hashem should fulfill their requests. That this should be the place where your prayers are answered. Now we know that in the first temple period, the first place Amigdash lasted for 410 years. So we know that during that period, there were some magnificent supernatural experiences that you could have when you went to the base Amigdash. In fact, they're listed in the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos in the fifth chapter. So there are 10 different miracles that used to happen on a regular basis when you went to the base Amigdash. Some of them include, for example, that no matter what the weather, there was always a column of smoke that ascended from the base Amigdash that was never affected by the weather. It, it, it could have been a gale wind, made no difference, it never moved. There was the, um, the fact that they slaughtered all these animals and nobody ever had ill effects from the smell, there were no flies. It was a completely pristine environment in spite of the fact that it shouldn't have been that way. But actually one of the most interesting miracles that happened at the time of the first base Amigdash is that we're told on the special day of Yom Kippur when the place was absolutely jam-packed. You can imagine what it was like. It was literally like sardines. Oimdim Tzufufin, the people stood and they were squashed together. But Meshtachavim Revochim, when it was time for them to bow and to prostrate themselves as you had to do a number of times during the course of Yom Kippur, suddenly there was enough space for everybody. In other words, that tells us that the Beis Hamikdash, in addition to all the other miracles that happened over there, the first Beis Hamikdash had this uniqueness about it that somehow space didn't behave in the ordinary way that space behaves anywhere else. So ordinarily, the amount of space that a person needs to stand vertically is obviously much less space than what they would need in order to lie themselves down and prostrate themselves on the floor. So logically, if there's just enough space for everybody to stand shoulder to shoulder, there should not be enough room for people to be able to bow. So this principle of the Beis Hamikdash being beyond the confines of space is one of the marked signs of what was unique about the first Beis Hamikdash. And that played out in another fashion, in a very interesting way. Because once a year the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would go into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, into the Holy of Holies. And when he went into the Holy of Holies during the time of the first Beis Hamikdash, inside the Holy of Holies was the Oran, was the Ark. The so-called Ark of the Covenant, as people like to call it. The Golden Ark. Well, I mean, that is what it's called. Aroin Abris. The Ark of the Covenant between Hashem and us. Why? Because inside of that Ark were the tablets. And the tablets represent the 
the contract between Hashem and us that we would fulfill the Torah and mitzvahs. So the ark itself was measurable. Right? You, you could calculate exactly how big the ark was, how tall it was, how long it was, how wide it was. You could also independently calculate the size of the Kodesh HaKadosh and the Holy of, the, of Holies from wall to wall. But the strange thing was that if you calculated the area or the distance from the end of the ark to the one wall, it was exactly half the distance of the room. And if you calculate it from the other end of the ark to the other wall, it was exactly half the distance of the room. So based on that we say, which means that the space occupied by the ark was actually not space. Okay, so now that's a very interesting concept because if you were to tell me that the ark was some kind of a hologram and it actually wasn't physical, then fine, okay, no problem, it doesn't take up any space, it's just a projection. But the fact that you could, that you could actually measure the ark and you could actually touch the ark and you could actually see that it was a physical thing that occupied space and yet at the same time did not occupy space, so that's a principle that we call nimna hanim no ois which basically is Hashem's ultimate greatness, the ability to accommodate contradiction, the ability to make the infinite and the finite coexist, the ability to allow space and non-space to be in the same environment. So that's evidence to the fact that Hashem was there. It's evidence to the fact that the divine presence was in this place because like anywhere else in the world, if you have an embassy, Inside the embassy, and we spoke about this the other day, inside the embassy you follow the rules of the host country. So inside the Beis Hamikdash, which is Hashem's embassy on earth, you follow the rules of Hashem. And the rules of Hashem are you're not bound by the rules of time and space. And so therefore it is possible to have a place that on the one hand does have space, and on the other hand doesn't have space all at the same time. And the human mind can't exactly wrap itself around this because it doesn't make any sense to us. That tells us, that the greatness of the first base Amikdash is the greatness of how much divine revelation was available in that place. So if you wanted to define what the whole first base Amikdash was all about, it's about divine, re uh, divine revelation, divine greatness, which is an incredible thing. Anybody, I think, if they were offered the opportunity to have that kind of revelation, they would grab it. They would grab it absolutely. In fact, we're told that that revelation was so intense that as a result of it, all kinds of things happened. For example, there was a man called Yonah. You heard of him? Yonah, the man who was swallowed by a fish, that's what he's most famous for. The truth of the matter is that Yonah was a prophet of Hashem. How did he become a prophet? Because he used to go, like everybody else did, uh, on the holiday of Sukkot, and he used to go to the base of Mikdash, and he used to engage in a massive celebration that happened there. And being part of that celebration opened your eyes to be able to have Ruach HaKodesh, to be able to have divine inspiration. And Yonah, because he invested himself so much in the experience, actually became a prophet as a result of it. So the, the opportunity, the potential, the spiritual flow that happened in the first base of Mikdash was unbelievable. Something completely beyond what any of us could expect. And as a result of that, there was the opportunity for people to be more acutely aware of Hashem, for people to have a far deeper understanding of Hashem than what we have today. And essentially, they were carried on the crest of the wave of the experience of being in the first base Amikdash. You go back into that period of history and you will find that there is an unusually high amount of prophets in the community at that time. We know the big names. The big names are the people who wrote books of prophecy. But people don't realize that at the time of any of those great prophets, there were hundreds and at certain times even thousands of prophets simultaneously because they were just drawing on this incredible energy that was available in the first base Amikdash. So again, how did the first base Amikdash happen? Hashem instructed it. That's what we call Isarusa Dile Eila, an initiation that comes from on high. Hashem can do anything, right? So Hashem can choose to say, I'd like you to make this building, this structure, it should look like this, should be in this and this place. And once you do it, I'll plug into that something that only I can do. So the initiative to build the first base Amikdash was driven by Hashem. The goal of the first base Amikdash was to have Hashem reveal Himself in that space to us. Therefore, the result was that in the first base Amikdash, there was this incredibly profound sense of godliness. Any person, Jewish or non-Jewish, who walked into that place would be exposed. Any person who went there, adult or child, would be inspired. It made no difference who you were. 
it wasn't really up to you. It wasn't about your input. It wasn't about your effort. It was about what Hashem made available to you. So the greatness of that experience is, if Hashem makes something available, there's literally no limit to what He could make available. Again, Hashem can do anything. So if we're talking about a precinct and an environment which is totally on Hashem's terms, then it is unlimited. The opportunities are unlimited. There's only one drawback though. Only one drawback, like anything else in life, right? Things have their advantages and disadvantages. So there's one drawback to that kind of system. And that is that everybody knows when you're given something and you don't have to work for it, unfortunately, people generally don't appreciate what they have. And that's unfortunately what happened in the first base Amigdash period. So Hashem gave them and He gave them and He gave them, as we say, with His overflowing hand, as the expression goes. Hashem gave them so much of Himself, so much of His revelation, so much of His blessing. What happened to the people? They became, um, you know, they got a little bit too complacent, a little bit too used to it. And they reached a point where they said, okay, so Hashem's going to give us anyway. So what's the difference if on the side we ha get involved in a little bit of Baal worship, or we get involved in a little bit of Asherah worship, or whatever happened to be the prevalent um, thing of the, of the time, you know, whatever was popular at the time, because people became jaded. The reason they became jaded is because everything was too good for them. It was too easy for them. It was too much on Hashem's terms and not enough of them drawing close. Remember we said the base Amigdash has two components. The one component is to create revelation of God. The first base Amigdash was doing an exceptional job of that. But the other component is Korban. Of us bringing ourselves closer and having to work on ourselves. And as the first base Amigdash period continued, so people started to lose sight of that. And they started to get involved in all kinds of other behavior. And therefore the first base Amigdash was destroyed. Because the people were not responding to what they were getting. After the first base Amigdash was destroyed, Hashem would never again do that. He would never again just lay it on a platter for us and come down from heaven and tell a prophet to instruct us to build a, a second base Amigdash. That doesn't happen. So that tells you already that something about the second base Amigdash will be markedly different from the first base Amigdash. So that's what we'll explore, please God, tomorrow. So what's the nature of the second base Amigdash and what particular way of serving Hashem is expressed through the second base Amigdash? To be continued.